Hello, everyone. This is Coach Courtney, the Emancipator from World Changing Mind in Atlanta, Georgia. You're listening to the Reboot Your Biblical Perspective radio talk show, where we identify the misguided modern day perspectives of the Bible, giving context to the spiritual dynamics of who and what you are via the lens of Rabbi Yeshua and his apostles in the name. On this radio show, we identify subjects and themes that have been misunderstood from the Bible, verified by pragmatic and experimental research carried out under the Zane Kai Keturah International Institute of Pneumatology. And hello, everyone. This is Tanya Whitkey from Virtual Kisses, speaking you, to you live from Canada. And we would like to give a huge shout out to everyone joining us on Kingdom Purpose Radio, YouTube, and Facebook. If you would like to ask us any question, guys, feel free to comment on YouTube at Anointed Life or join our Facebook group, Anointed Life Mentorship International. And I'm Zainal Fuego, coming in from the <laughs> Trinidad Republic of Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. In terms of biblical pneumatology, I'm specializing in terms of biblical interpretation at the International Institute of Pneumatology. Woo-woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm bad! I'm bad! <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So, yes, everybody, so we're back with a new series. And... Um, We'd like to introduce and introduce to you guys about God. What is God? Mm. And um, yeah, a lot of people would probably think about God in different scenarios or different ways, what they, they think God is. But we want <clears throat> to break it down to you guys today on the Hebrew thought heritage of what God is. Right. So, should we start off with some scripture? Let's yeah, it. let's go. Give us, give us the scripture. Okay. <laughs> so, um, guys, John 4, 21 to 24 says, Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for mm. salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worship the Father worshipers the Father seeks. Mm -hmm. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Mm. That's such a good one, especially because it says in verse 22, you worship what you do not know, and we worship wow, yeah. what we do know. Mm. 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 Wow. Mm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we worship what we do not know. What, do you, what does that mean exactly? I mean, so in this definition series, we've already done faith, hope, and love. So if you haven't listened to those, go back. And mm -hmm. we're helping you understand what these actually mean through the lens of the authors that wrote them. Because a lot of times, well, all the time, <laughs> we have multiple views on what something actually means and so because we don't have the understanding of what it means then we have really no results in our walk and our faith that we want to have and mm. so and people are getting sick and dying because of this misinformation mm -hmm. right? so worship what you do not know well first of all, the first thing in particular is before we even I dive into the idea of God as, as we're speaking about. Mm -hmm. I, I really think that that's, that's something that it functions like a double entendre for this segment, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it's something that Jesus is referring to specifically for them, but at the same time, that's the, that is the predicament of Westernized Christianity. Right. Not in the same context, but it's the same predicament. Because mm -hmm. we, we say God in our culture and it so happens that the God that we refer to in our culture is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right. And that's like a, a moment that anybody should gasp. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 right? when Jesus said that to her, he was actually alluding to some historical data that um, not many people are familiar with, but it's, it's good to know. Is that after um, after King Solomon passed, he, he what he did 
resulted in the division of Israel after he died. Hmm. Um, King Solomon in particular began to in, engage in some, in, into some things that was not, this has nothing to do with the women that he had and so on. He's speaking about practices that he started where he began to come off of equity. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. himself, who was speaking about equity, was no longer functioning from equity. And he began to enslave certain tribes. Mm -hmm. so, so, so to put heavy, heavy burdens on them. Without, without having to go into the details concerning that, basically what happened was that Israel split. Ten, ten tribes went north, as actually referred to as the northern kingdom by, by the prophets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and two tribes went south. All right. Um, that when, they, when that happened, they had the temple in Jerusalem, which was a temple that was originally established as the temple of King Solomon, the temple that Solomon built. Because of the split, they decided to separate from each other, and the northern kingdom built their own temple. And so the, the actual temple under the Mosaic line was the one in Jerusalem, but the tribe of Judah and Benjamin remained in Jerusalem which is why they call Judeans, because it was the tribe of Judah, and, and living, in, living in Judea. So that, that goes hand in hand. And then they built a separate temple in the Northern Kingdom, and they began to conduct worship there, which was not according to the Torah. Those in the Northern Kingdom were commonly referred to as Samaritans. The way you're speaking about Samaritans, they were actually Israelites, but not considered from not, not considered from Judea. So that is actually a war amongst Israelites that you're looking at there. Mm -hmm. So when he tells them that you you worship what you do not you what you do not know, it's because that's not the actual temple that was established by Moses. So they were doing things that were outside of the Torah and therefore they built their own they built their own um their own system mm -hmm. and they were worshiping God in their own way, which was outside of the covenant. That's so deep. Yeah. So likewise, that actually, if, if you flip it here within our culture, our culture, Westernized Christianity, is not covenantal based, which is our next, which 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 should be our next gasp. <gasps> <gasps> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Because if I am to relate what has happened in Westernized Christianity realistically, watching it, mm -hmm. watch, watching it, watching it for what it is, mm -hmm. we we have assumed a form of worship for Christ in the same way a Gentile nation would actually come alongside Israel, visit the nation, see them worshiping God. Do not enter into the covenant and just assume their practices. Mm -hmm. And just assume that we are worshiping God ourselves. Right. While they are worship, they are actually meeting covenantal criteria. You are you you are actually just incorporated some of some practices into your life. And you, you call that worshiping the God without formally entering entering into the contract. Mm -hmm. And so you what you have is a is a a practice that resembles something, but it's nowhere close to what it is. Hmm. And this, this could be just isolated practices because what we have done in our culture, frankly, is isolate things like fasting, praying, reading, about, reading the scriptures from our own interpretations of a text that didn't come from our thought heritage. We just interpreted those things and, and put it in into the... Um, into our lives, and then we call that worship in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And many may be surprised to know that Western Westernized Christians, Christians in our society, you do not know what it means to walk in, in Jesus. Instead mm -hmm. of covenant, Jesus has been made a, a moral standard that, that one looks towards to actually validate whether they're doing, they're being a good person or a bad person. Whereas covenantal life is totally different. 
So if I am to be objective and blunt, most Christians are not really following the scriptures in that context. They they unfortunately form fall under what Paul said, you know, that we, we have a form of godliness, but it is not God. Mm. It, mm. So so what, what Jesus said kind of applies to us because we worship what we do not know in the westernized world. Which brings us mm. to the understanding of what God is. Right. Mm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Totally. So, so the first thing we want to break down here is what is what Jesus said God is. He said God is spirit. And our definition of spirit is what adds further to the to the misguided perspective of what God is. Because in our understanding of spirit, like the typical person in our society today, when you hear spirit, what your mind usually goes to is what you see in the Hollywood movies and things like Chucky and... Um, like something being possessed. Yeah, the exorcist. <laughs> um, Candyman, all these horror movies. And what you... What that is, is that you assume that there's a spiritual entity that is walking around in a place doing things. Hmm. And so what we attribute in our minds is an ethereal, when I say ethereal, some entity that doesn't have a physical body, but it has a spiritual body, some kind of body that it, walk, it is walking around in the form of a man and doing these things. Hmm. We just assume that that is what it is. Right. And when we think Jesus saying God is spirit, that's the perspective or that's the imagery that we apply to God out in the sky, sitting on the clouds with some babies playing harps. Hmm. And he's, stro <laughs> he's stroking his long, never ending beard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I must admit, that is how I saw the Father. Prior yep. to understanding it, I mean, I really did. I always yeah. imagined this huge throne and him sitting on it, and oh. then Jesus had a throne next to him, right. and mm. then there were also extra thrones for for us to sit on because we're at the right hand of the Father right. because of Jesus. So, I mean, you are not telling lies; you're telling the truth. Well, it's 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 generally what um... that would be a lot of thrones. <laughs> I don't know how it worked out in my mind, however. I don't know. Yeah, that would have been a lot. One next to the other, that would go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. But I true. Sure I even even um before I I began this research, I uh, most people kind of most people within the circle of anointed life may have heard my my life story, but for 20 years, I studied all kinds of different things to try to understand the scriptures, and it was always in my mind that they were sitting on a throne somewhere, and Jesus' throne was right next to God's throne, and they're sitting down watching each other and watching down, and I don't know, and it never really crossed my mind what they'll be doing, what they'll be doing, <laughs> sitting watching on a throne all day, all night, but <laughs> I just assumed that they were there. <laughs> checking the list and checking it twice. <laughs> I'm sure that we're not being naughty or nice. That would be nice. Not naughty. They're like uh, they're like Santa Claus. They uh, rain right. down gifts on us when we like, please, Father. And then he's like, no, because you didn't do this yesterday. Right, right. <laughs> well, that would definitely be something um coincide to what Jesus says. You worship what you do not know. Right. It falls so squarely in it, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're picturing something that we think it is, but is it? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and a lot of it is actually tied into how we interpret scripture in the Westernized culture. Absolutely. One of the things that we have done in our Westernized Christian culture is use Jesus' parables to, to discern spiritual truths and to go into revelation, which, which are visions using, script, using scriptural and, and Torah terminology and prophetic mm. imagery. And we assume that what we saw in Revelation was the reality of the spiritual realm. Mm. The mere fact that we can do that shows how uneducated Westernized Christianity is about the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. 
So God, Jesus says God is spirit. And if we apply that perspective, then we are actually just no, no different from the northern Israelites who created their own temple and was worshipping God in the way that they thought they should worship God, independent of the covenantal requirements to worship God in the, in the actual temple. Because if the temple was a concreting of what Moses built to be the physical model of the garden, then these, not, these northern Israelites technically built their own garden, Maybe. which which is falling squarely mm, mm, mm. in Genesis chapter 1, because if you're not in the garden, then you're, you're building your own garden outside the garden. And where your garden is? In the desert. Which is what we've done. Dust. <laughs> yeah. That's probably why we don't see a lot of men. We, we may see spurts of it but not a lot of manifestations of in the garden exactly and it should be the norm for us just it as it should was be. for them if we're following the exact same thing mm -hmm. it should be the same results it should be it should be we should have the same results but the lack of the lack of power in and of itself should be like a red flag should be. and should unfortunately be. What has happened is that we have had church culture that has developed over time where we take the failures and we create conditions that God didn't act, conditions through which, for which God didn't act. And then we circle around again and go, we'll do it again. <laughs> and we do it again. And as Einstein says, Einstein himself said, who was a Jew, he said, that doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different results is the definition of insanity. Insanity mm. as it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, that didn't yeah. work. Okay. Well, we'll come up with some reasons why, and then we'll try it again, but we do it again with the reasons why. Right. Hmm. And, what, and what we have done is basically try to walk through a door without opening the door. And so we walk in front of the door, our, our foreheads hit the door, putum. <laughs> so that, that didn't work. Let's do it again. Butum. And that didn't work. Well, do it again. Butum. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a, you, you, you almost remind me what you're saying is like uh, a bee going to the window. I can, I can, I can. I can right, get out. Right. I can get out. But it's, it sees a glass. It doesn't see it's a glass there. It right. keeps hitting itself. That's funny you say that because when you were saying that, it made me think of, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but you have to understand what you're saying or what Christ is, yeah. what God is, in order to understand how you can do all things through Christ. All oh, again yeah. is, all again mm. is but, but <laughs> <laughs> Rehashing, rehashing. And yeah. nobody was, nobody was stuff and saying, maybe you don't actually do it like that. Mm. Push Push the lever in front of you and see and see see what happens. Hmm. Nobody went do that. So we have nineteen hundred years of just butum. Mm -hmm. Right true. Right true. So when Jesus says God is spirit, he is not speaking about what we have assumed in the Western eyes would. As a matter of fact, um Jesus did not exist in the Western eyes world. Yes, Israel was under Macedonian control for some time and then came into dominion by Rome. But Jesus did not live in the Western Eyes world. And so what we, two things actually happening here is that we have had Westernized church fathers that have assumed the authority to interpret scriptures that did not belong to the heritage of their, of, of their mindset. Yeah. And then West, the Western eyes will pretty much follow the line. So, needless to say, that spirit is not what we have been taught in the Western eyes world in the, in the context of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Not only is it not what we have been taught in the Western eyes world, but it is also not real. What we have thought is not real. And we can see this after now we are at over 50,000 hours of research at the institute and we can verify that that perspective of spirit does not exist it is not real 
it's theoretically misguided, it's also practically it does not exist. Hmm. But to understand in the spirit and culture of the scriptures, because of how the scriptures are designed, if you want to understand what spirit is, you will need to go back to the first mention of what spirit is. And that takes you back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And the Spirit of God moved upon the surface of the waters, and God said, let it be light, and there was light. Mm. You know, without having to break that down, it's, it must be understood that Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 are couplet chapters. And Jesus interpreted, as well as the ancient prophets interpreted, well, specifically Jesus, who brought even more context because he was necessary for them to be able to interpret the scriptures more accurately because he was the only one that would come and actually walk in the name, in the capacity of the first man in the garden, and not from the outside perspective that everybody inherited. Mm -hmm. So when he came along, he pretty much got more perspective on the scriptures, and he interpreted the garden narrative as a... He demonstrated in his interpretation that is... that. Um, Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, the Spirit of God and the breath of life are actually parallels. The Spirit of God and the breath of life are parallels. Hmm. Right? So, which, and Job actually confirms this. Job actually refers to the breath and the Spirit as one and the same thing. So Job pretty much confirms the fact that what Jesus is saying is he understood it. He understood it like that, which means it was a common ancient understanding that was lost over over time, especially when Israel went into captivity and they in, they they involved themselves with Babylonian and Persian and Macedonian perspectives, Islamic perspectives, Roman perspectives. But in the ancient realm, in the ancient world, ancient era, they understood the spirit of God in chapter one to be parallel to the breath of life in chapter two. Right, which is why. Um, therefore, let there be light is the same as the breath of life. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus constantly makes it mirror reference of himself as life and light. And he even at one point in time in the Gospel of John says that he makes reference to the light of life. Right? This is what John communicated in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. This is what Jesus demonstrated in, in Revelation chapter one, chapters 1 to 5 where he referred to the seven stars which were the seven leaders of the seven churches he identified them as the seven spirits of God now, Western Christianity is lost concerning this because mm. they have been reading the text through the westernized logic which is which is now identified as step logic reading everything in a chronological sequence and chapters 1 and 2 are actually written in a system of logic called blocked logic so Chapters 1 and 2 are actually parallel, strategically paralleled. So when we say the spirit, we're talking about the breath of life. Now here's something that is interesting. The spirit, which is the breath of life, in the ancient Hebrew, in the Hebrew, in the ancient Hebrew culture, and especially the prophetic culture, the breath of God is the same thing as God's name. Mm. So to say that God breathed the breath of life into the dust is to say that God breathed his name into the dust. And therefore, if you read the text through their system of logic, you see that chapter 2 actually indicates that man was Yahweh Elohim in flesh. Mm -hmm. A living Yahweh Elohim. Just like uh, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was God. The word there is in reference to the man in the garden. Mm. Because where that comes from is really understanding that everything that was framed in chapter 1 was framed actually in the consciousness and the mind of God. And in the Bible, word and thoughts are one and the same. In our westernized culture, we see words as something that what we speak from our mouths. In their culture, your thoughts are words. Mm -hmm. So when the prophet says, the word of the Lord came to me, he's speaking about a thought, a vision, which is a mental picture. Mm. So in their understanding, um, God breathing breath of life into the dust is God breathing his name into the dust. So the title Yahweh is the title of the breath. We, then, we can then also understand that the title Yahweh is attributed to the spirit of God. That's the title of God's spirit. 
Now, in addition to this, they also parallel mind, heart, and soul with spirit. Therefore, these things are not separate things. They are understood in the ancient cultures as functions of the same breath, which is the same spirit. That's does amazing. That, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right. So, um, so in, you would say the the heart, the soul, um, those things that you mentioned. If they're one, then they're that would be like the thought of God coming as a word. Yes. In, as, yeah. Okay. Right. Everything that God thought is his word, and therefore he's referred to as the word made flesh because that's all of God's thoughts that was breathed into him, and the God's thoughts took the form of a realm inside of his consciousness. Mm. Like his, his, which is the next thing that they understand spirit to be in the, in, in the old, in the ancient world is what we call consciousness today. They call spirit. We call mind. Because in that, in, in, uh, um, in the ancient culture, and even in, uh, in even in, um, biblical scholars today indicate that there is no word in the, in the ancient Hebrew language to refer to brain. They understand all of those things to be coming from your spirit. So right. that's where he said when he blew breath into the dust and he became a living soul, it, mm -hmm. it's showing what the thought, the thoughts, all that stuff together, the soul part or the spirit part came into flesh and you've got a man that looks exactly what his thoughts were on the outside. The, the thoughts frame him externally, yes, but yeah. the thoughts are actually a lot yeah, let's say that how he looks outside would, could be about 5% of what the thoughts are. Okay. What he looks outside physically is about 5%. The rest of it is actually an entire realm that he has in his imagination, that he sees himself in. Mm. Everything that God said is framed as that realm. So he would have seen himself in their understanding. He would have framed, seen himself in the garden and would have seen what he looked like in the garden as a being of light. Right? Because God said that there'd be light and therefore it was referring to him, the breath of life. So he would have been seeing himself as that light. Right? Now, <clears throat> one of the things in particular that is not taken into consideration in Westernized Christianity is the, sim the simple fact Um. The simple fact is that we do not, I think Western Christianity is afraid of terms like consciousness and energy. Hmm. They see it as ungodly and related to heretical belief systems like New Age systems and so on. But in the ancient culture, what we call consciousness and energy, they also understood to be spirit. It is not articulated with the word consciousness, but Paul does refer to it as ener as energia in the in the New Testament, where there's a common commonly where he says the workings of the spirit. The word workings yeah. is the is the Greek word energia, so which means he is saying that is the energy of the power of God. Hmm. So spirit here is. It's because that breath is mind, it's heart, it is consciousness. You can say that the mind and imagination of man was mm -hmm. called Yahweh. His, his mind and imagination and the realm of that mind was called Yahweh. Every aspect of it was called, every aspect of him was called Yahweh. Not only his physicality, but his, his thoughts was the thoughts of Yahweh, the mind of Yahweh, the imagination of Yahweh, the energy of Yahweh, the consciousness of Yahweh. Paul, Moses mentions this. He, when, he, when he was in the wilderness, he does say outrightly that he is not doing this from his own mind. 
if you invert it, he's actually saying that he's doing it from Yahweh's mind. And the Yahweh mind was simply a mindset that was based on a principle of, of intelligence, which was one using the spirit itself as the reference point for its system of intelligence, a reference point of life, yeah. being a creator, being um, exclusive to one spirit as a creator, sovereign, and autonomous amongst the creation. Mm. The, 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 when, the mind, you, when you stop using the, the Yahweh mind is where you begin to use external things as a source of intelligence to, to tell you what to think. Now, in their understanding, a spirit is, is energy, it's a consciousness, and it expresses itself through what we would call a mind, which is what we're referring to, like when we think about our ra process of rationalization mm -hmm. or mental pictures, all of those things are seen as a mind in Westernized culture. Mm. So, for the first thing that we need to understand here is in the Torah, it actually says it always referred to Yahweh your Elohim. Yahweh your Elohim, the Lord your God, the Lord your God. That's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And if Yahweh is the spirit, because they were actually outside of the garden and Moses gave them this, provided this Torah from Yahweh. And in the text, it actually takes its time for Moses write the text to demonstrate clearly that the mind, his mind was called Yahweh. Because once the Spirit comes upon you, like in the Old Testament, the Spirit comes upon you, your mind is now Yahweh's mind. Your imagination is Yahweh's imagination. Mm. And they treated the mind and imagination, the thoughts, with the same... See, in our culture, we are taught that the mind is not real, and therefore you treat your mind like if it's a, a blackboard, where you just have mental pictures that can't affect anybody else. And we treat the physical realm as that which is more practical. In the ancient world, the prophets treated the mind of, once they were walking in Yahweh, once they were walking in that cognitive law, they took on the name and they walked in that cognitive law, their mind was treated as, as real as metal is real. They would interface with that as though it was metal interfacing with something that was tangible. You see evidence of this all over the scriptures, like when this Elisha stands there against the Syrian army and he says there's much more for, for us than those that are against us. And his, his servant didn't really, or his disciple didn't really understand and he, and he prayed that his eyes be open and then the disciples saw angels surrounding the Syrian army. And that, and that gave Elisha you see uh, Elisha actually functioning there. He's seeing a vision in his mind as a prophet. That's where they're mm -hmm. seeing everything in their mind. But to him, it is as real as the as the um, as real as the physicality of the world. Right. Now, where am I going with this? Is basically to understand that. There are two concepts here of God that we are not aware of in our Westernized culture that are interchangeable and move one into the next. Whilst in Westernized Christianity, you treat God as a person sitting in the clouds, as one entity that is ruling over the entire universe, or ruling over all of heaven and earth. He's just one person like with a different physicality. The first thing that we actually want to understand in the, in the, in the ancient culture is that they don't see a spirit as something that has an entity that has a physical body or resembling a physical body. Mm -hmm. they, they see a spirit as consciousness, as energy. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in their mind, God is the energy, and the, which is a conscious person within which the universe exists. Hmm. And I know even when um, I was, you know, growing up in the denomination that I grew up in, um, hearing that word energy was an automatic turnoff for us. So I know that this is like really eye-opening for people 
Um, but I also think you need to remember that during this time, there were a lot of cultures happening around the Israel lights and a lot of the information or the words that were used, they were using a lot of the common words, but the way that the Israelites had the understanding because of the Torah, right. it was a pure, a pure definition, the, the authentic definition of what right. that was. What it means. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a good point because a lot of people believe that because these cultures use the same words, they assume the same definition, mm -hmm. and it is not like, so. Like for me, um, I didn't really understand most of the definitions. I came from a place where I was walking, uh, walking. I, I think walking from my my heart, my spirit. Right. And if I did feel at, like if I'm in bed and I feel this the presence and there's and like electricity, then I'm like, okay, God's here. But I didn't really know, like understand the definitions of what's going on. Right. So it's a whole different world. <laughs> it is. It we is. All, yeah. Mm. But I just it said is. that so people that you are not getting turned off by the use of the word and really just understand that. It's because of the understanding and the definitions you have why this is probably a little bit shocking. <laughs> yeah, most likely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that he's not sitting in the clouds. 100%. Mm -hmm. so, so the first the first definition, the first reference to Yahweh here mm -hmm. is spirit or consciousness or energy or that's all, that's all one thing. And mm -hmm. all, I, I, I notice I have to list all of these words because in the culture of the ancient Israelites, when they say Yahweh, they mean all of that. Yes. In our mm -hmm. culture, these things are separate as separate concepts. And that's why when we hear Yahweh, we don't understand what they understand because our language is so different that these concepts are separated into seven, eight, and nine, and ten pieces. Yeah. And so the typical English reader will never pull them together and realize it's all of those things because it's mm -hmm. not related in our language. Right. So they understand Yahweh to be the, you can say, science is now calling it the, the quantum field or the energy field. Mm -hmm. That's another way of saying Yahweh, the person that is not limited to a physicality, a spirit, can leave your body and inhabit a car and make the car alive. Mm -hmm. A spirit can inhabit a house and become the house, right? The spirit in your body is in your body, and your body is maintaining the form that the spirit is given here. But mm -hmm. the spirit is not limited to a physical body. That's a westernized thought. In their understanding, a spirit is, a, is, a, is, a, is consciousness, and that consciousness could fill a tree. It could fill an animal, just like you saw in... Jesus actually cast the devil, the devil out of the man, legion out of the man, and it filled animals. Right in the pigs. Right. So the spirit is not is not limited to its form. It could take any form that it enters, like water. Mm -hmm. it, could, it could enter a cup. It could enter a shot glass. It could enter a jug. It could enter a barrel. It, it could be. A, it could enter a dam, and it will take the form of the dam. That's why Christ is in all things. <laughs> exactly. And this is where. Jesus walks on water, so the spirit um, held him. Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> right. That's awesome. But it's not really spirit held him. That's he is self-existent. So that is his spirit holding him, not wow. that the spirit held him. So, first of all, the first context is Yahweh is the the volume, so so to speak, within which all creation exists, mm -hmm. within, within which Yahweh Adam creates heaven and earth. Right? Heaven and it is created within the volume of Yahweh, within the space of Yahweh, and we call it the universe. But when we say universe, we, we, we really understand physicality like the planets and so on. Mm -hmm. And they understand in all of this atmosphere that is free between you, the space between the planets and all of that, all of that is the energy of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And right now you have science is actually proving that the space between the open atmosphere is charged with the greatest concentration of energy. That's why they're trying to tap into the Higgs boson. Because they've understood that the atmosphere before us is not free. It's not there. It's charged with, with strong electricity. Which is why 
lightning and things are possible. Yeah, I was going to say when thunder and lightning and it's, it's loud and it's interesting to watch at the same time. Right. Yeah. And it is on this note that, that Paul says that you live and breathe and have your being in him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? There's a second context of, 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 of Yahweh in the Bible and that is your breath in your body. Your energy in your body is called Yahweh in the ancient culture. But when man left, when, when man fell out of the garden and he began to compare himself to a tree, he abandoned the title Yahweh and he took on a, a, a name that was not his own. And because he was in God form before he, he fell outside of the garden, his decision caused his spirit to shift and could not come back to external reference points. So Jesus had to actually come and take it on, put it to death, and then rebreathe the breath of life back into humanity. So right now, everybody on this planet, their breath is Yahweh or Yeshua. It's not just this person in the sky. That breath that you're breathing is called Yeshua. Now, because the Paul in the New Testament also says that you have the mind of Christ, but this bypasses the typical Christian thought because they do not relate the mind to the spirit or the spirit to the mind. They have been taught in westernized theology that they have a mind independent of God's spirit in them. And not that your mind is just a revelation of your what you make your greatest priority in life. So you could have the mind of money, you could have the mind of possessions, you could have the mind of social status. But if you're making Christ in your priority, then your mind is called Christ. Mm. Now in the test in the scriptures, which is where I'm coming to, we say God to refer to God like a person in the sky, but in the scriptures, God is not understood like that. The title God means, which is Elohim, it, it is translated authority and power. And yes, it is a title that is translated authority and power, but not in the context that we understand authority and power. Because when we say God, what we're really thinking is about a person that has great power. When they say Elohim, they're referring to the thing that you are using as your greatest importance in life. Mm -hmm. the thing that is stirring you with strength the thing that you trust the most that's what they're calling Elohim you're using that as your authority your power, your ability to be inspired the thing that justifies you and justifies your decisions that is what they are calling Elohim now most people don't understand that so when the Bible uses Elohim to refer to false gods and they call him Elohim, that trips the westernized mind. Mm -hmm. Theologian, theologians today still don't understand it. Because they see God from the Roman and Greek perspective of God. They call Zeus a God, Neptune a God. But in that culture, they don't call persons gods. They refer to God as anything that you are using as your reference point in life. That's your God. That's your Elohim. So when they say Yahweh, your Elohim, they are referring to your Yahweh mind, your spirit, as your strength, as your reference point. So the prophet, just like anybody who understands prophecy and have been prophesying, you know that this imagery comes up in your mind. You, you have your imagination that is working. Mm -hmm. When you are prophesying, you are seeing what is in your mind, yes? Yes. yes. In their culture, what you're looking at is Yahweh speaking. And therefore, when you function on using that, what you see in your visions to speak or to take action, that's making Yahweh your Elohim, which is your mind, your spirit, your Elohim, your strength, your reference point to make decisions. Hmm. That's so good. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. So for them... That's why they walk in power because, because they are spirit and the spirit expresses itself as mind and imagination and they understand that their mind is the mind of Yahweh. They can have a thought, act on the thought and the energy of that thought transmits into the physical realm. Mm -hmm. But you experience that on a regular basis because if you make a plan to go on a vacation right now and you follow up on that plan, are you not transmitting the energy of that plan that you see in your mind into the physical realm for you to end up at the location for the vacation? Yes, you 
Yeah, you're if, packing your bags, you're going towards what you saw. You're doing the same thing. The difference mm -hmm. with somebody who is walking in Yahweh is that they're actually self-existent. Therefore, they're using the nature of their spirit as a creator. And they acknowledge that their mind has the power and the energy to start a universe. Mm -hmm. To create a universe, to create the sun. So that they, 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 they live in a realm where their spirit is acknowledged as most powerful. And therefore their mind, their imagination is, is most powerful. So when Moses tells them to obey Yahweh, your Elohim, because the entire Torah came from his mind, his thoughts, his imagination, because Yahweh, once they take on the principle of, of Yahweh's name, the functioning self existent mindset, they, they understand that the mind in that principle is Yahweh. They write down their visions. And so Israel, obeying the law, is obeying the mind of Yahweh, which is why he refers to, to the Torah as the voice of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. The voice of Yahweh, your Elohim. In other words, it's the same thing as saying the voice of your consciousness, your strength. Your consciousness is your strength. And if you really think about it, that is what it is because what your, you have built your mindset on that is what you use as your authority and your strength in life. Mm -hmm. So God for them is not a person. It's what you're using as a reference point. Yahweh is the person. And once, mm -hmm. you, once you have Yahweh's spirit, like a prophet or a priest, and now everybody who is resurrected in Christ, then you can trust the thoughts of your mind because it's, if it is a self-existent thought and aligning with God, Yahweh's perspective in the scriptures, then you can trust that that is Yahweh and therefore you can trust your consciousness and your mind as, as Elohim because that is the voice of Yahweh. So do you see massive difference? Massive. Massive. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and it, it's, we're also used to, because he's this God in the sky, he's God far away from us, which also affects how we interact with God, right? Yes, yes. Because now he's this God in the cloud, whereas you're saying that he is literally a part of who I am. He is your he's not separate. He is the substance of your existence. There's no separation between us. I, I want this. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's, that's all. Go ahead. No, Hebrews 11.1 1 is, some, is a verse that many Christians quote. Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, faith is the substance of things hope. Psalms, faith, faith is the substance of things hope for the evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. Notice it says, it is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Most believers do not know that what it is referring to is your imagination. Mm -hmm. Your imagination is the substance of things hoped for because it is in your, in your mind and you, and you, are, you have the, the, the desire for it to come into manifestation. And it is the evidence of things not seen. Your mental pictures is the evidence of things that are not physically seen. But they don't, they don't make the connection because Paul, Paul refers to faith as a fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians. Mm -hmm. But he also refers in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, he calls faith the spirit of faith, mm -hmm. referring to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you pay attention to what he's saying is that he's saying is that the Holy Spirit is the substance of the things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, meaning that the Holy Spirit is the substance of your existence. And the Holy Spirit here is your mind. Mm -hmm. So good. See what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So I can hear silence all across the board. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> And so we, because we have been taught the God in the sky perspective from the Greeks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we see no power in the westernized Christian world. Because if, you, if you're giving priority to God in the sky, you are vilifying your own mind as evil. And as the thing that is supposed to be powerful, you have, you have by your decision, made it weak. Mm -hmm. And therefore, God's power cannot flow through you. Wow. So you said God is energy? consciousness and breath so does that mean that 
when I take a breath, I am breathing God. Well, to be more specific and to be just, just for the speak of specificity, Yahweh and Yeshua is that what you just mentioned there. God is using is the use or the ref or making um God is making sorry to make them your God is to make Yeshua or Yahweh your consciousness, your mind, the imagination in the mindset of God. Um, your reference point. So God is not a person. God is what you're using as your reference point, as your strength. Mm -hmm. So when the scripture says you are um, you are Elohim, mm -hmm. they are not referring to God as we think about it. They're speaking about Yahweh because Moses said that Yahweh is your Elohim. Mm -hmm. So when the high priest <clears throat> Asaf wrote that, he says that you are Elohim, mm -hmm. meaning you are Yahweh. And so if he's your reference point, that's almost like when a man was in the garden and they had the tree of life mm -hmm. and they had the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So yeah. if you choose life, that is you making God your reference point. Yes. When because you're choosing the other tree, that is when you've made some other Elohim your reference point. Exactly. Your consciousness, your and awareness. And and by the way, the, the book the Torah in the book of Leviticus actually defines a devil as the thing that you use as a false Elohim. Mm -hmm. So what most people call in devils is really something that they're using external of God's spirit as their reference point. And they are using it as a mindset. And because their spirit is creative and it reproduces after its own kind, you have created a spirit that you are filling your body with. And then somebody has to come and cast it out of you. Mm -hmm. you got two definitions tonight. Come on. Wow. <laughs> you got devil and God. <laughs> so, yeah. because, again, because the yeah. term devil is a false God. Mm hmm. So if you're talking about God, then you need to talk about the false God to be able to clarify which is which is the real Elohim, the real reference point. And the false Elohim is called the devil, whereas the real Elohim, Yahweh, is the actual Elohim. Yeah. So um, it would look like before Elohim man, Yahweh, Elohim man was formed, it was just Elohim, the thoughts, the yes. power, the if you separate everything else. That thought, that power, that created, well, like, like you said, the universe that right. that gives life to all things, the spirit of God. Um, that is what we look like. That is what you're looking at. Yeah. And over time, they've actually the the, the, the authors like through Israel's transitions and things like that. Then they began to use Elohim as a title to refer to Yahweh. Hmm. But when Moses and and and, and um, when Moses was around, Yahweh was your Elohim. And so it's used interchangeably, but I hope that I actually give context to what really Elohim is. So that you know when he says you, you are Elohim, he's actually saying you are Yahweh because Yahweh is your Elohim, it's your strength. And for those of you who don't really understand what I mean by your strength, that's the thing that you use as to know what to do. So so, or the thing that is giving you strength. You know, some people say, boy, I live for my child. Every morning I get up and I go to work because of my child. Hmm. That is using your child as your strength and therefore you're using your child as your Elohim. Or I live for my career. I get up every morning with, 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 with excitement and enthusiasm to, to reach to work. I live for work. They're using work as the Elohim. And what that means is that it is giving you life. It is causing you to generate life so that you can move, so that you are enthused, enthused so that you are filled with excitement and inspiration. You are supposed to be using Yahweh like that. And because he is self once, once your mind comes into self-existence, then you're using the energy of Yahweh. It is consciousness. Consciousness, you, your consciousness 
can generate power to create a universe once you actually decide that it is, it is that powerful. Once again, silence. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these terms, energy, consciousness, mind, heart, spirit, breath, all of these things are one. Mm. Um, mental disposition. Um, what else? Mind. Mind. Um, spirit. Well, I mentioned those two already. Mind, so. spirit. What else? There are other, all these terms realm. As, as realm. Realm. That's a separate... When we say spirit, realm, you're speaking about the realm of your consciousness, the realm of your mind. Mm. And because Jesus, you have Jesus' spirit, the realm that you have in your spirit, the kingdom of God in you, your imagination, he has it also. And so mm. that comes into synchronicity one with the other because it's one spirit. Therefore, you could have... Jesus has multiplied his spirit in everybody and once everybody comes back to the new Jerusalem which is the realm yeah. of Christ's spirit in you you can speak to Jesus in your in, in, in your consciousness you can see him and speak to him because mm -hmm. one of the things in particular the prophets and this is my last point for, for, for tonight one of the things that the prophets actually indicate in the scriptures is that what you imagine is not a figment of your imagination. It is as real as a person. It's as real as a person. It's as it's 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 actually more tangible than your physicality, mm -hmm. because your physicality your physicality can adjust to how you frame your consciousness. So your consciousness, therefore, is has more has more real existence than your physical body that is beyond the westernized mind to understand well it's just like um father father god besides yahweh his besides man he saw let us make man it was already built in his consciousness yes it was alive he's seen it so when we say Elohim in the scriptures, we are speaking about God in you, not in the sky. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what, You are Elohim. That's why it says you are Elohim. Because you're taking on God's name as your own. You're taking on the cognitive law, and therefore you, have, you are now Elohim. And that's what the good news is, actually, that we're supposed to go around and say is, hey, you are Elohim, and you just need to renew your mind or take on new definitions for your consciousness. Hey, do take you on know? new words and new thoughts. Mm -hmm. Do you wow. know that, that that is what they mean when they're preaching the gospel of God? Yes. Mm -hmm. It is the it is the gospel <laughs> that you are God. You are mm -hmm. God. The gospel Jesus even the good said news it. that you are God. You are Elohim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus definitely said it when he was talking to the Pharisees. Didn't it didn't say in your law that you were God? Yeah. When they try to accuse him. <laughs> yeah. So I hope that this gives context to our listeners. Mm-hmm. It's good, rich information in here, guys. So rich. So good. This is good. This is good. This is a good conversation. I think so. I think so. Mm -hmm. And we're going to keep doing it. We're going to keep doing these, uh, these definitions. So if you have some, be sure to let us know because we're going to keep trucking on through the year, helping mm. you understand what the ways of the self-existent definitions that the prophets amen we're using <laughs> amen the biblical perspective radio show with Tanya Wiki, Courtney King and Zangier learn more about us by joining our first group Facebook group the Anointed Life Mindset Mentors just kidding <laughs> the Anointed <laughs> Life Mentors <laughs> 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 We're visiting our website, International Institute of Pneumatology.com. And guys, to listen to this segment again, find us on Anchor, Apple, Spotify, uh, Amazon, Google Podcast. And if you have any topics, guys, you guys like to discuss or cover, please leave us a comment on Facebook 